Well, welcome all you wiretappers out here, back here in the studio of Gangland Wire. Uh, I'm going to have a, a show that uh, might be a little bit different. This is part of a series of shows. I'm going to do more than one about mob guys who had a religious, Christian, an awakening, an experience, a, a spiritual experience, if you will, and change their lives around. There, there's a lot of you guys out there, and and I've got one of them on here today who was on the show before. If you want to know a whole lot more about his life, his, his criminal life, go back to my interview of uh, Kenji Gallo. Welcome, Kenji. Well, uh, thank you for having me, Gary. Thank you. Now, Kenji, you've got a book. Tell tell us, uh, tell my wiretappers out there what the name of your book is and how you uh, find it. My, my book is called Breakshot, A Life in the 21st Century American Mafia. And Breakshot was my FBI code name when I wore a wire for the FBI. So, and you've got a website too. You used to blog. I didn't say I was looking at, looking at it and it looked like you've been blogging so much in the last year or two, but. Uh, no, I, I, I saw that probably about four or five years ago. I quit blogging. Long. Yeah, I just I got to the point where I just hadn't didn't have any more to say, and the same people I'm writing about the same people doing the same thing. Yeah, they, just keep, they, they get out and get in trouble, and I was just <laughs> I got bored with that, and my life moved on, and I just didn't feel like writing about them anymore. But it's still up there, and people, I mean, like a million people visited last year, so yeah, it's still yeah. it, they still want, look at it. There's a lot of good stories in there. The, it's uh, Breakshot. Just Google Breakshot blog and, and you'll find it. I'll put links to his book and where you can buy his book and and okay. how to find his blog uh, in the show notes, folks. So today we're going to talk about his. He had a, a spiritual, religious, whatever you want to call it, experience. But tell us a little bit about your life now. Just a touch. I know that you're on Instagram and and you do physical fitness things and and are a trainer uh so tell us just a touch about your life now we'll get more into that later well my life now is um i moved out of the city i lived in, i live in a in the country um i i have a gym in a small town like agricultural town and uh i train a lot of people um i i learned how to train people i mean i've been I knew how to box and uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt, and I used to teach kickboxers. And when I lived in Los Angeles, I used to train professional athletes. Here I train mostly uh, older. I, I train a lot of uh, younger people, but I train older people, of men men in their 50s and over, and I train them boxing and, and fitness because I was a conditioning coach for world champions in California is what I did. And – so I have my own gym and this is what I do. And, and, and I, I just do a lot. I do a lot of community stuff cause I do rock city boxing for boxers with Parkinson's mm-hmm. and I do that kind of thing now. And I really enjoy it cause I love training people. So it's my thing. Cool. And, and he, he posts a lot on Instagram for you Instagrammers, you know, I'll put a link down to his Instagram and, and you'll see a lot of posts from, uh, from Kenji on Instagram. Uh, to go back a little bit, if I remember your story right, Kenji, you were raised as a suburban kid and, and ended up uh, uh, getting in trouble as a teenager. As you know, this is the off-told story of, of every every boy in some ways, and some boys get start getting in more trouble and more trouble as they get older, and some get out of it, and and you got in more trouble, and and you got involved in a, a variety of different criminal activities, drugs, and. And uh, strip clubs, I believe, out in the southwest part of the United States and California. And, and at some point in time, the bureau came to you and and they turned you, and, and you, but you refused to wear a wire against people you knew back in California. But you knew people that didn't know very well back east, which is a, this is a heck of a story, folks. Uh, young Asian boy from South Southern California goes to the Northeast and infiltrates the mob, the, the crime family. So tell us a little bit about just about that shift and, and where that wire enough to kind of establish you are a real deal. Okay. Well, I was with the LA family, the Los Angeles family of Costa Nostra, which was the Milano family at that time. And uh, my capo was a, a guy named Jimmy Kachi, Dominic Vincent Kachi, well-respected. And I liked Jimmy a lot. Um, I didn't and I, I when I was FBI wanted me to flip and I didn't want to wear a wire on them and they said they weren't interested in on the on in them. They were more interested in all the people that I knew because I traveled a lot. And uh, I was in the in porno business, the pornography business. 
And I got to meet guys in New York and different places. And I had friends in the Colombo family. So I decided that I would go back East and I ended up, I was just going to go and just test the waters. And I ended up moving to Brooklyn, to Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And uh, the FBI was like all over that. They wanted me to wear a wire and uh, deal with that. So I start. I, I, the reason that I even thought about flipping was it, it really wasn't because I was even in trouble. It was because I come to the point in my life where everything was, I just felt like it was over and I didn't want to do it anymore. And I wanted out and I just didn't really know how to do it. I knew that I couldn't trust myself even to be out because I tried before and they, dude, I always get called back and there's money to be made. I just be, and it's just so easy for me. So I knew I had to burn my bridges or throw a hand grenade over my bridges really. So they offered me one thing and they offered me a fresh start. And now a lot of people today, they're mad at the FBI. They don't like the FBI, but these guys, these guys did a good job with me and they kept their word. Okay. I didn't lie. I never had to lie. I never had to do anything. I never carried a gun. I never committed crimes when I was, when I was working with them. I was, I was a straight arrow. I made a decision when I did it with them that I wasn't going to break the law anymore. I decided that I just, just for myself, and because I made a deal with them that I was going to keep my word and not do it. And they kept their word with me and uh, it changed my life. I mean, that changed my life in a lot of ways, but it brought me to where I am now. I just couldn't do it anymore. And when I was in Brooklyn, I had some clo close calls. Like we were going to go out on a, a hit and kill some people. And um, to tell you how serious it is, the kid that I was going to go on the hit with now is the boss of the whole family now. Mm. So at that point, he was the captain. Now he's the boss. And uh, he's not a kid anyway. He's like 58 years old. I just yeah. I referred to him as a kid, but he's 58. He's older than me. Yeah, really. But uh, it's, uh, we can, were can serious. Can you say who that was? Can you say who that yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. It was it's Teddy Persico Jr. Okay. And the whole story of me in the car, it's been told. It's, it's, a, there's, it's in some documentaries. It's, yeah. on, it's on Nat Geo. You can hear it. And uh, we were going to do a hit. And long story short is when we pulled up to the restaurant where we were going to do it, there was already like a police car, a couple of NYPD police cars, uh, a hook and ladder, like a huge yeah. fire department and a, a paramedic and an ambulance. And they were wheeling a guy out of the restaurant next door. He had a heart attack. And I honestly thought at that point in my life, I thought that the FBI was really listening to these. It wasn't just a recording. It was like a wire. And they had did this <laughs> to stop this. But of course, they didn't. And then I thought I'm the luckiest human being in the world. It, did, it took me years later after this incident. That was like 2004. So it took me till 2014 to realize that <clears throat> it was really God, God's hand that kept me from get, getting into that. Because from that, there would be no coming back from that. Yeah, yeah that, know, that, that was crossing the Rubicon, as they say in Italy. Yeah, No coming back. So did you have like a, you didn't have a bright light kind of experience is my understanding is more of a, a growth, educational, spiritual growth kind of experience. From well, maybe that kind point of, on, was that a pivotal point? Well, that was a pivotal point, but here's what happened to me. Even I, I got out of, I got out of it. Like I was, I wore a wire for eight years. Okay. All this stuff happened. I got out and I was, and I, and I, and I went into witness security and they changed my name and I did everything. And then I just thought, I don't need to be like a Christian. I could just be a good person. I know everyone hears this all the time. Yeah. I'll just be a good person. I'm going to be, you know, karma, whatever that means. Yeah. And I decided that I would be a good person, but I was still going to make money and make money whatever way I could, as long as it was legal. But legal doesn't mean right. You know, just like yeah. pornography is legal, but it's <laughs> not right. I don't believe it's right. And uh, so what happened with me is I was training people like how I train. And uh, some of the FBI agents who I trained FBI agents too when I, in, in Los Angeles, and some of the ones that I had uh, that had been my handlers were Christian and they never pushed it on me, but they used to always tell me, you know, maybe you should talk to somebody about this, or maybe you should look at this. And I would be like, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, one of my clients who was an actor in, uh, and another guy, they gave me a, one of them gave me a Bible 
another one took me out to lunch and uh it was before christmas like in 2013 and uh i was like got out to lunch with them and then the first thing he sat down he goes i don't know you know kenji you seem like a really good guy you seem really spiritual but have you ever thought about jesus christ and then I thought to myself, "Oh no, really? Yeah. I'm stuck. He's gonna he's gonna do this." And he's a really nice guy. He was like yeah. good guy. I liked him. And I'm like, "Oh, I'm gonna be stuck the whole lunch." But I'll hear him out because you know he's a nice guy. And he just told me his story, mm-hmm. and it was like a five minute story about how his whole life changed one time when he prayed, and everything changed, and that was it. And he never brought it up for the whole lunch. So then that got me thinking about it. And then I just told my wife that, hey, I just want to go to church. And the first time that I went to, I found a good church that I wanted to go to. And the first time that we went, I thought that everyone like would know that I'm a fraud. Like I'm not like the rest of them. Like um, I thought they're going to know, like I'm just fake. I had been to church. Like I'd been brought up Christian. I'd been baptized. I'd been church, you know, until I was 15. So I've been, I was gone from the church for like 30 years. Yeah. So I know I knew everything. And so once we got in there and we started singing hymns and everything, it was like, that was when I had the moment, it, everything, it just, it hit me. And it, every, all those things I had been missing for all those years and wanting and craving, it was good. And I used to, I had a lot of problems afterwards. Like a couple of my friends were murdered, you know, during the, in the life and like that. And they were yeah. murdered and I saw them, I found them. And, uh, and I was with a, one of them before he was killed. And you always go over in your mind, like, you know, if I would have just did this, I would have just did that. I could have changed the outcome. You know, I couldn't have changed the outcome. It was, it was happening. And I used to feel really bad, bad, bad about this. And after when I was in the church, I felt like at that point I was calm and there was no more mm-hmm. like the Holy spirit was in me. And I could just feel that my life had started to change and that was it. And I just started, uh, going all the time, reading the Bible, you know, trying to live it, trying to be the best I can. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think like when you become a Christian, you're just, those, those people are perfect. No one's perfect. <laughs> yeah. There's only one perfect person that was here. He's not. Yeah. And that's it. We just, all we can do is strive and try not to make the same mistakes and commit the same sins again. And it's like, they always think too, like once you become a Christian, your life is going to be so easy and things are just going to go smooth. <laughs> things never go smooth. Things never went smooth for me. It's been a struggle, but it's like, I know though, but I have a rock. Like I know inside that, that I can do these things and that I'm not alone. And like some of this is just a trial. And like, you know what they always say is like, uh, this too shall pass. It will. It, it always does, no matter how bad things are. And like a lot of people think that things happen to us, but they don't. A lot of things we've caused or we put ourselves in those situations and you have to really think about it. So that's when my life changed. And that's, it's been about 10 years now, just a, a little bit less, maybe, you know, nine. And uh, I mean, my whole life has changed before I just, I, I, and th- after that, I couldn't, after being Christian for a while, I couldn't even live in LA anymore. I had to move. I just yeah. couldn't do that in lifestyle anymore. When I was there, I wanted to continue to write in the, in the movie business and maybe get like, a, hopefully I'll get a reality show and do stuff. And, and, uh, I'm so glad I didn't because this is not is not what I wanted to do. It would not have been good for me, and uh, I'm so I'm blessed. I mean, my life is is completely different than I thought it would be. I've, I've done things I never thought I would ever be able to do. Um, I got finally. I went to Israel with my church. You know, I spent three weeks there. I mean, it was it was amazing. I, I never thought that I would be able to do that in my life. I didn't think that I would even be able to travel because they wouldn't accept me there you know, being a felon and everything. Yeah. But I I was able to go and, uh, you know, visit Jerusalem, the Western wall, multiple, multiple times, you know, get, uh, I got baptized in the Jordan river again. I mean, it's just, uh, Mm -hmm. these are things, but like when, once I got to Israel, it was like the Bible came alive because I got to go to all the spots. Yeah. And I got to go to Capernaum. I got to see the sea of Galilee. I got to, to see, uh, I went to Jerusalem. I went to the Western Wall. I went to the Temple Mount. I went to uh, Mount of Olives. You were, know, the were, Garden were of Were you Yisimini. able to go down to Manger Square, or was that closed off? See, that's actually in Palestine, where the yeah. No, I went to I went to I went to Bethlehem, and I Bethlehem. went to the I went to the West Bank. So, okay. 
Yeah. And then uh, the only place I didn't go was Jordan at that point. I re- I wanted to go to Jordan yeah. and uh, it just wasn't, we just weren't able to at that point, but uh, yeah. I went up to the border with Syria, I went to the Golan Heights and I went to, uh, um, you know, the place where Jesus told Peter, you're my rock. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, I went yeah, to, I, I did, I did that in Israel, uh, uh, mainly by myself, but it is, it's, it's kind of overwhelming at times. Yeah. And if you let let it overwhelm you, if you let it wash over you, and don't resist it, it's it's a pretty special feeling seeing all those things. Yeah, I mean, I I brought my Bible with me too, so I was like would read through it, and like we went to Shiloh and like all the different places and uh, Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, when we were there. I mean, it was just uh, you know I tried to do all the stuff. Yeah, cool. About, yeah. So, so your life today, you, you you train people. You live in a small town, and you probably have a, a church there in a small town that you're closely, intimately connected with. I would imagine. And yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people think when you when you quit drinking and smoking and, and whoring around that your life gets boring. But uh, I didn't find that to be <laughs> my experience at all. <laughs> no, my no, life. my life is not is not boring at all. It's it's fulfilling. I have a lot of friends, normal friends, and. Uh, it's actually, it's much better because I, I enjoy my life and I see my life for what it is. And, and you realize, I think, like, I've come to realize that uh, all that stuff, money, the, the stupid clothes and everything, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I mean, I don't even have a TV now. Honestly, I don't have a TV. Right. I don't watch TV. No, I don't have cable. I don't watch TV. If I want to watch something, I guess I'll watch Netflix or something on my, I don't even watch Netflix anymore. I don't have that. I have Amazon. I watch stuff online, you know, once in yeah. a while. and. Uh, on YouTube. But other than that, I don't, I don't really watch TV. I don't, but I have plenty of friends. I don't get, I, I'm busy all the time. I go to, uh, to, uh, you know, a lot of, st- a lot of local stuff. I'm yeah. involved with the local po- politics and, uh, you know, through people I met at church too, in different places. And yeah, you got your dogs too. Yeah. I have my dogs. <laughs> I, I, I love, I love my dogs and I love being around. I blacksmith. I took up blacksmithing. And, oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I learned how to work with metal. Took took a bunch of courses and uh, set up my own shop and make knives and s hooks and different things. Oh, interesting. Well, it's uh, it, it's a refreshing story compared to some of the stories that that we talk about on here. You usually, don't get those firsthand because those guys are dead. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's uh, it's an enlightening story. And I, I hope that that you guys out there that listen to this. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take heart. And, and, you know, if your life is in turmoil and, and you feel like you're drinking too much or you're partying too much, or you're, you're like, like I was, we were on your second wife. You knew that wasn't going to uh, end well. Uh, you know, there, there is another way to live. That's for sure. And, and Kenji's a shining example of that. And there's life after all that playtime that we had when we were young. Kenzie, I, I really appreciate you coming on here. This is going to be part of a series of, of guys who lived the life and, and then had a spiritual awakening. And, and so it's like what they were like, what happened and what it's like now. And, and you're an inspiration to a lot of people. I assure you that. Well, I, get, I just want to tell everyone that remember it's, it's hard. It gets hard. And uh, even, even if you try to get sober, I never had a problem with, with drugs or alcohol. Um, I used them when I was a kid, but not, not older, but it's like, you slip up, you make a mistake, you just move on next day. You got to just keep going. It's always the next thing. It's, it's one foot in front of the other. It's a, and it's remember, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint and, and, and you'll get there. And one day you'll look back and you'll say like, you know what? Wow. My life is really fulfilling. And this is what I'm really supposed to be doing. And, uh, it may not have to do with like money and material things and, and, and just be happy. And learn to love it. Like I love to read. I read a lot of books, and it's just it really, you know, I I read the word every single morning, and it just gets me going. So, okay, Kenji Gallo, Break Shots, his book, and and this is a little bit about his life. And I really appreciate you coming on, Kenji. No problem. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having. Me.